a podcast about amazing people from an incredible state. Amazing Arizonans with Mike Broomhead. Another edition of Amazing Arizonans, and I don't even think I have to introduce him. We all know who he is. Sheriff of Pinal County, Mark Lamb. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, Mike. Appreciate um, it. Thanks man, for the intro, too. Listen, there are so many of these, so many different directions I want to go, from your career to the Senate race. Um, but I, I think I want to start with a story that I'm really upset with you about. <laughs> I, I was watching on Instagram, and I saw you tell a story of when you were on your mission, because you yeah. were LDS. Yep. And I watched this story twice, and it brought tears to my eyes. And I've known you for a long time. You've never told this story on my show. Uh, I was so angry. You know, I don't even think I've told my kids that story. I think I've only probably told that story maybe two, three times in my entire life. Will you tell it again? Yeah, so uh, now that it's out there, everybody knows it. But yet it was a story that I just didn't really tell a lot, and I really, honestly, I don't think my kids had ever heard it. Is, it, is there a reason why you didn't tell it, or was it just one you didn't tell? You know, it's hard to tell because it's an emotional story for me. It was a very, uh, it was a very deep uh, moment in my life, and so, you know, those stories are usually you kind of keep those kind of. Would well, you mind telling touch. it? Not at all. Okay, all right. Because it's out there. I mean, millions of people have seen it now. You know, I was on my mission in Argentina, and uh, love that place, by the way, and. I was uh, working in this one area, and I actually had two companions at the time. Normally, you have one companion. I had two. I had a, a new guy from Argentina, and I had a new guy from um, Idaho. And we had had this day scheduled out, and the day wasn't going well at all. Everything was canceling, cancel, cancel, cancel. And it was just one of those days where finally we're just like, hey, should we just go home, go back to the apartment and just cash it in for the day? I mean, it can't get any worse. And uh, as we were getting standing on the corner, we're standing on this one corner, and we see this old man, a bum, just crossing the street, dirty, just shuffling, can't even walk, he's just shuffling his feet. And he's getting close to the other side, but he's crossing the road. And we're standing on the corner kind of talking about whether we should go back to the apartment or not, and or whether we should help this guy. And at the very end, I said, you know what, let's just help this guy. So we walk across the street right as he's getting to the curb and he's trying to step up on the curb, he starts to fall. And we literally get there right when he's falling and we catch him. And we kind of stabilize him and we're talking to him and we can't understand what he's saying. We don't see his face. His face is down. He's mumbling. And so we can see he's walking over towards this kiosk. And so we start to walk to the kiosk. At that point, the sun's still out, but it took us probably 40 minutes to get to the kiosk, really? which was probably only about 30 oh, yards. Okay. Yeah. And so we finally get to the kiosk, and now it's getting dark. And so there's a light above the kiosk. And so we asked the guy at the kiosk, we're like, hey, where does this uh, guy live? And he says, oh, he lives right over here. And we said, well, does he usually get something here at the store? And he says, yeah, he usually gets milk and candles. And so we said, well, can you give us some milk and candles and we'll pay for it? And while we're standing there and my two companions are there, this is the moment you know, you're know you referring to is we uh, it's kind of a, a light above us and getting a little dark and. I'm standing in front of him and my two guys are standing on the side of him. And at that point, he we hadn't seen his face. He was dirty, dirty hair, dirty clothes. And he looked up at me and undoubtedly it was the face of Christ. And he just looked me straight in the eyes. And then for probably what seemed like, you know, uh, 30 seconds, but it was probably only a few seconds. And then he put his head back down and we never saw from, we never saw his face again. And I looked at the two companions to the side and, you know, you, what we could feel something had just happened. And also the other two saw and felt the same thing you oh, did without no talking question. about it. I could call that guy in Idaho today and say, do you remember the story of the old man? And he would know exactly. I mean, we, we knew exactly what we had all seen. Did you ever see him again? So we never saw his face again. And so we could kind of understand him saying, who are you, Kinnison? You know, we speak but it wasn't Spanish. a language barrier. You spoke the language. We spoke the, you the just language. Under, he, we couldn't understand him. He yeah. was just mumbling. And we just at the very end, we said, we're just angels from God sent here to get you home. 
So we walk into this, past this gate, and then there was a little closet at this in at the front of a house and we open the door to the closet and literally there's a chair and a table in front with with uh melted candles and argentina milk comes in a bag and so there was older bags of milk sitting on there so we put him in the chair and behind him was just all this trash and literally just had a chair and a table with the candles so we set up his candles we set up his milk and then we left you know, we were still, you know, what we were feeling was high as could be. You know, we were just, we couldn't believe it. So we came back a couple days later. This was, I think, a Monday night. We came back on Wednesday and there was kids playing around and we're knocking on the door. And finally we said, hey, where's the old man? And they said, oh, no, he died two nights ago. Oh, no. So that night. I didn't, I didn't hear that part of the story. He had actually died. The night that we took him and set him in that chair, he died that night. Two days later, we had gone back to check on him, and uh, he had died that night. So, you know, here we then we were telling him, hey, we're here just to, angels from God bringing you home. We didn't realize we were literally, you know, that wow. he would die a few minutes, uh, a couple uh, that hours later. So it's what's remarkable about that story is it would be one you would think you would shout from the rooftops that you actually witnessed that, but for yeah. you to hold it so personally for yeah. so long. But what an incredible testimony of faith and um, acknowledgement of faith and validation of faith. Yeah. Incredible. And you know what it, what it was for all of for us too is, um, and I said this on that podcast, is you just don't know when you treat people, and this is part of the reason why I treat everybody, whether it's the janitor or the billionaire, I treat everybody the same. I am because everybody is somebody and that what what looked on the outward appearance as a bum and dirty and everything yeah. was one of the most spiritual experiences of my life. It was when people asked me what was the spirit most spiritual time in your mission, teaching people about Jesus Christ and God, that moment, which was not a teaching experience, which you know, didn't result in somebody converting. Yeah. It was, that was the most spiritual experience of my mission in my life. And it was an, an experience that had I just looked at it on the surface and passed it by, I would have missed one of the most, the most spiritual experience of my life. When you, um, have you seen the Jordan B. Peterson videos where it says, if you want to change your life, treat everyone as if they're Jesus in disguise for one week? Yes, yes. If it, you know, if you would come in the house and mom's doing the dishes, if that were Jesus, I'd help her do the dishes? I have seen that. And that and to it me, is, yeah. So that had to have changed your perspective on, any, on everything. It did, because then you realize that God is in the things that you least expected. You know, and it also it goes further than that. The great things that you will experience in life are in the times you least would expect it. They're oftentimes disguised in testing your willingness to reach out across the table, testing your willingness to treat somebody a certain way, testing your willingness to not look past things that where they, it may not seem great on the surface, but really what the best things in life are oftentimes hidden in, in the worst packages. So it's interesting because I grew up in the South and there was a lot of, there was not an LDS presence where I grew up. Yep. So I didn't ever meet anybody, any people that were Mormon until I came to Arizona. And so I didn't know anything about the LDS church. I mean, nothing. And I've gotten to meet so many people and I'm not LDS. I was actually raised Catholic. And then I actually taught an adult Bible study at a conservative Baptist church for 10 years. <laughs> so I've seen both sides of that issue. Is there an issue with you, with the people that don't know anything about the LDS church? Does that concern you at all with all the the, the conversations about the differences in, in, in things? And are you really Christian if you're this or that? Is that how do you address that? Oh yeah, that, you? that comes up. You know, people will say, well, I, you're, you're LDS. Well, I'm Christian. Well, LDS are very Christian. Like I be, we believe in God and Jesus Christ, and that is the definition of Christianity. Is but do you, you feel a need it. to defend? No, I don't ever feel the need to defend it. As I've gotten older, I've realized what is more important to me is that people have faith in God and Jesus Christ, and it doesn't matter what faith you really are. I mean, I it helps when you, if you're of the same, you know 
faith where you you were raised with the same ideals you know my wife and i were raised in the same church that helps to not have to traverse that but there are people that don't like it you know i posted while i was on the campaign trail running for senate my son came home from his mission and i posted a, vi a picture and something about him coming home and immediately people were like oh i didn't know you're mormon i'm not voting for you now yeah and it's like, how does that affect who i am as a person i mean before they like you and then the second that to me is I think part of the problem with this country yeah. is that we can't see past people's personal choices as to where they want to, what they want to do. I, I may not agree with people's personal choices, but I don't, I don't disparage them and I don't hate them because of it. And did, I think that's part of the problem in this country. Did your, do, I, I, this is a dumb question because I know the answer. H explain how that faith affects how you behave on the campaign trail because politics is an ugly business it is and you can't get in it without <laughs> it something being ugly attached to it that's right how how does your how did that belief affect how you campaign we always have a joke in our family it says you want to know what you did wrong in life run for office you'll find out yeah whether you did it or you didn't do it you're going to find out politics is really ugly and when my wife and I got into the Senate race, we didn't want to do it. And then we had some personal tragedy that really kind of pushed us into it. And then we started looking and saying, nobody good wants to run anymore. Or there or pe really good people out there with really great hearts. I'm not saying that people that are running aren't good. I'm just saying that we have a real small group of people that want to run. And there's a lot of really great people that could really do well for the state and the country that don't want to run. Why? Because politics is ugly. And so what we set out to do is we said, look, we're going to either win with honor or lose with honor. But we're going to run our race with honor. And we're going to run a race that's not about somebody else. We're going to run a race that is about what I bring to the table, what qualifications I have, the experience I have, and why I think I'm best for the job. And I think we, we did that. You know, I think we ran a race that was focused on that and not focused on anybody else. You get questions no matter what, but I think I was always very good about answering uh, the question in, about and re getting it back to me and my qualifications. And I think that's what politics needed. Whether I won or lost, I think that is what I brought to the race. I brought to the race that you can still be a decent person and do well. And there is a, a saying, blesses are the peacemakers, we use all the time in law enforcement. But I also think it, it, it should extend to politics. Blessed are the peacemakers. We should be out there trying to do good and be good. And to my faith... You know, you don't get to pick and choose when you're a Christian. Just because you're running for office doesn't mean you can start bashing people all the time and then go to church on Sunday and, and try to be a good person. I think you're either a Christian or you're not. And the way you carry yourself in public and the way you carry yourself in all situations, including politics, tells you to people whether you're a Christian or not. And when you fail, you own up to it. Yeah. You try to make it right and you move on. That's right. The, the perception that if you're a person of faith, you present yourself as somebody that's not flawed is one of the worst things that we ever do. <laughs> that's right. I, as a person of faith, I know how imperfect I am and think that people want to see that. They want to see the, hey, this is an imperfect man just like me. He's willing, he's capable of admitting where, he's, where his shortcomings are, where his faults are, and I'm that person. And look, I didn't win the race. I worked hard. I, I, I tried to push out a good message. I, I, I still believe I was more than qualified for the job. But in the end, it wasn't in the cards. And right. so if you're a competitor, you're a fighter, you realize, look, some, like I said the other day at that event, sometimes you eat the bear and sometimes the bear eats you. My dad taught me that at an early age. And I did everything I could. The bear ate me. And uh, I'll live to live another day. And it's, it doesn't affect who I am or the confidence level I have. It just, in the end, it wasn't meant for me, to be for me. So, um, You alluded to personal tragedy. I don't know how much of that you're willing to talk about, but um, Paul Penzone was in here and did this podcast. And one of the conversations, I don't know if we did it on the air, 
but he talked about one of the most difficult days he ever had in life was having to go knock on your door. I love Paul Penzone like a brother. I think he was a great sheriff, and I think he did really great for Maricopa County. He was exactly what Maricopa County needed. And um, it's funny, I'll go to Republican clubs and people will say, oh, that Paul Penzone. And I'm like, he's my friend. Oh, oh, I, I'd only heard, you know, once you st- stop yeah. people and say, look, he's my friend. And my wife and I will always have a very close place in our heart because uh, December 16th, 2022, we have five kids. My middle son, Cooper, who had had a lot of struggles before, but had really turned around and cleaned his life up and had a fiance. We, they were probably going to get married within the next week. Of this happening, um, they had a, a, a daughter, 11 month old daughter. Um, my son left for work on December 16th at 8:30 at night. I had my wife had been wrapping Christmas presents. I had been home, um, or I had gone to a dinner, and then I had gone done some Christmas shopping. I came home, and I'd only been home for maybe 30 minutes, and uh, we get a knock at the door, and we open the door, and it's Paul Penzone. Um, the uh, two of my chiefs and two guys from Gilbert PD. My wife, I was fighting with the dog because the dog goes crazy when people knock on the door. So I put the dog in the laundry room and my wife's like, it's Paul Penzone. It's and and Matt and Matt, my two chiefs, they're both named Matt, which and um, we came back and we opened the door and you could just feel and see that something wasn't right. And one of my chiefs has known my kids and see what they were little kids. And uh, my chief just looked at me and said, Cooper and the baby are dead. <clears throat> and immediately, you know, the, the air goes out of the room. Like you can't even fathom what you hear. I know my wife sitting over there right there. She was like, what did they say? Um, and but it was to see Paul there and my two chiefs. Those are guys that are very close to me. And so I couldn't have asked for people, better people to deliver that, that type of message. But I can only imagine with all the messages Paul's delivered, that probably was one of the harder ones that he had to deliver. But uh, it was a tough moment for us. But at the same time, a lot of people go through these types of tragedies. And our faith and the prayers of other people are certainly what carried us through. I watched my mother endure it with my brother. And um, the notification team from the military was trying to find her at home, and she had moved. And one of the neighbors said, well, this is where she works. And then the neighbor, not thinking, called my mom at work and said, the Army was just here looking for you. So she knew what was coming. But I watched her endure that time. Now, I lost a sibling, but it can't be anything like losing a child. And to watch... The grace of your family, the kindness, not showing hate or anger under the circumstances of how it happened, I think was so inspirational. I don't know if people have said that to you, but it was so inspirational to for you to be so transparent about your sadness, but to not show anger or hate. And that's one of the things about my mother I was so proud of. Pride in her son, sadness for the loss, but never a moment of anger or hate. Yeah. You know, the anger wasn't going to bring our kids back. Hate wasn't going to bring our kids back. We couldn't control that. I teach kids all the time three different things. I teach them to be authentic, be who you are. Everybody here in this world has got different fingerprints, different DNA, different irises. We are all sent here to this earth. There's not anybody like you in this world. So every one of us has a special purpose on this world. And on this world, so I tell kids: be authentic. Number two: don't be afraid to do the uncomfortable work. All the good stuff in life comes through hard work. But then the third one I always tell them is you have to surrender the outcome. The majority of anger and, and depression and, and anxiety in this world comes from people trying to control an outcome that you can't control. So while we were destroyed and we were just, I mean, stricken with grief, I had to remember what is it I teach these kids all the time. I teach them that you have to surrender the outcome. Hating somebody wasn't going to change the outcome. Um, You know, being angry while you still feel that some level of anger. I can honestly say personally, it never really hit me. I never really felt that deep anger. And I attribute it to faith, but I also attribute it to the prayers of other people because we got through a very difficult situation. You know, a lot of people don't realize my wife lost in one year. She lost her mom, her son, her granddaughter, 
her daughter-in-law, because my granddaughter and daughter-in-law both died in that accident as well, and then um, her grandma. So we had a whole year where we were, most people don't, they were only seeing a, a certain part of it. And then we did a video a week later. We couldn't do a video any sooner mm -hmm. because my daughter-in-law was still alive. I remember. And so she lived about a week longer. And so that Friday, we made the decision, her family made the decision that they were going to take her off of life support. She died within a few hours. And uh, we did the video after that. And the video that we did, we did one take. We didn't do any takes. We didn't rehearse. What you saw was my wife and I just getting up and speaking just completely from the heart, one take, done, posted it. And um, a lot of people did have mentioned that video and just our approach to how we, how we took on grief. I'll tell you one more story that we were in the airport maybe six months later, and um, we were getting ready to fly to, I think, uh, Oregon or somewhere, and or Washington. I was going up to speak in Washington. And this lady comes over, and you can see she's just been crying and just really upset. And she comes up and asks my wife if she can give her a hug. Well, that lady was fo a follower of ours, and she said, I, my son died last night, and I'm flying to, to Washington to go for his you know, to be, to go see him and to be there for the funeral. And she said, seeing you guys here at the airport is a sign to me that I can make it through this. Wow. It, those stories and the, your wife didn't sign up for the public life. No. And you ran for sheriff. She agreed, but it is one thing to suffer. It's another thing to know that you have to do it publicly. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't about thinking about how people see you, but everybody knew. I reached out to you like yeah. I'm, uh, thousands of others did that know you that public life. Sometimes when that spotlight's on you and you can't turn it off, it's got to be difficult that you would love to be able to just blend in and suffer the way you want to without the public notoriety. It is. I actually looked at it as a different way because it is tough because everybody's looking at you. We had a, we're sitting out, you can imagine your own agency, hundreds, thousands of people in a circle watching you in the middle, whether you're going to get up or not. And so it actually motivated us and gave us the courage to stand up and move forward because knowing that so many people were just looking at you, it's, you know, when something bad happens and everybody stands there and waits to see how your reaction is going to be, I think it actually gave us that push, that courage to get up and move forward. And it doesn't mean that you don't have the grief, but we didn't, we couldn't just sit there and sulk in the corner either because it, we were in a, in a position where we had to do something because so many people were watching. Did it change your perspective on how people in your agency knock on those doors now? Change my perspective. I've done that. I've knocked on those doors. You know, I've been that guy. And I think I think my agency saw it a little bit different, too. I think when you when you feel it personally, um, I had actually had an experience not long before I lost my son. I was I had had a guy with it was uh, filming with me. And Drew Hernandez, I don't know if you know him, but he does some stuff with Turning Point. He was out filming with me, and he gets in the truck, and within five minutes, we get a call for a motorcycle that had been in an accident. And so we show up, and I'm, one, I'm the first one there. Me and another deputy show up, and I'm doing CPR on this kid. And the kid's 17 years old. And um, I'm doing CPR. Then he takes over, and I look at his ID, and I realize he lives just really close by. And I could tell that this, at minimum, he was going to go to the hospital, but more than likely he wasn't going to make it. And so I wanted to go tell the family and get the family moving in the right direction and immediately. So I jump in my car, I drive over, I knock on the door and he comes out. He's like, hey, Sheriff, how's it going? And he could see in my face and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not here for a good reason. I'm your son was just in an accident and I don't, it doesn't look good. Well, he goes inside and he grabs his wife and his wife comes out. She's like, Mark, we went on, we dated each other in high school. 
And now I'm here delivering this message. We go to church with them. We're in the same area. We live, we're neighbors. And to deliver that message only to have it months later happen to me too um, was was tough. But we have a special bond, you know, where we see each other and we, we, we share that same grief of having lost a son. More than losing my son and more than losing my granddaughter, our um, daughter-in-law was losing my 11-month-old granddaughter. We were, we raised her. I mean, she was born and raised in our house. They were our everyday people. My wife and I put that girl to, to bed every night or many of the nights when her mom was struggling, um, getting her to quiet down or <laughs> was yeah. so tired that she wasn't waking up. We would go in and pick up the baby and put the baby back to sleep. So... Yeah, that was probably harder for us because our son had lived a life. Our 11-month-old granddaughter had not had much of a life yet. So, Well, I like to think she had a great life in the 11 months she was there yeah. because she lived with us. But those were, those were hard things to overcome. When you look at your perspective, I mean, you, we started off with your faith and going on your mission when you were younger. Uh, and it's a, I know we're all over the place in your life, but – the law enforcement decision and all of these pieces that seem to have put you in that position, what do you attribute to not just being in law enforcement, but one of the most recognizable faces in law enforcement in the country? Because you truly are. What? How did that happen? Why did that happen? You know, I'll be honest with you. When we got in, I, was, I got in later in life. I was 33 when I went on my first ride along. And... Uh, I've told this story many times, but we got a call. It was on the Indian Reservation, uh, Salt River, just not right there next to Mason, Tempe, and Scottsdale. And uh, it was a graveyard shift. We had a call. For and great a, people. Great people. We had a call for a dad who had found a 20-year-old with his 14-year-old daughter. So they get into a scuffle. A guy runs out the back. We show up. I'm out there. They let me out of the car. I don't know how. I'm armed with a flashlight and courage. And you know how the res is, be, you'll have a house and behind it, maybe nothing. Yeah. Old abandoned travel trailer. Yep. That's how this was. And so I'm walking out there and I look in this old abandoned travel trailer and amongst all the trash and debris, I see what I think is a quarter size of skin. And I'm like, hey, I think this guy's in here. So they go in there, move all the stuff. And sure enough, he's there. And they grab him. They rough him up. They tase him, put him in cuffs. Well, I went home that morning and told my wife, hey, I'm going to be a cop. Did she think you were crazy? No, no. You know, I was doing pigeon control at the time. I was pigeon. up on roofs every day, cleaning people's roofs and pigeon proofing their <laughs> houses. And I think we were more concerned about me falling off a roof as a self-employed guy. So when I went to the academy, everybody would say, are you worried about your husband? And she'd say, no, I'm, he, this is safer than what he was doing. And we had five kids. So now all of a sudden we had insurance. I was going to get paid holidays. Like this was a good thing for us, even though I had five kids. But what it did was it gave me a very different perspective on life. I didn't come from a cop family. I came from the business background. I had had a bankruptcy. I had lost cars. I had had failed businesses. I had had successful businesses. Like we had been through the ringer. And so when I became a cop, I was very different from a 21 year old kid who wasn't married with no kids who had never really done much in life. And he's going to get a paycheck every two weeks for the whole, his whole career. I'd been through that grind. I'd been through the low times. And I, when I would show up to people's houses, I had a very different perspective and understanding of what they were going through than maybe the average cop did. And I think those things really kind of prepared me for ex kind of helping traverse the the tra the tragedy and grief that you've come in contact with in this profession. What was your first assignment as a cop? Where were you first? I was just a beat cop right in the heart of, of Salt River. You know, I didn't like the casino beats because you had to deal with too many drunk people. Um, I liked working right in what the- What year? Uh, 2006, okay. 2007. And that was kind of right from the start. I thought I wanted to be a range deputy and and just be out there, but I immediately took to gangs and drugs. And uh, I wanted to be a gang and drug detective. And within a couple of years, I got on the gang and drug unit. And that's where I spent most of my career was on the gang and drug unit. This was Salt River? Yeah. Yeah. And I loved it. I was great. It was uh, uh, challenging. 
it tested your fear limits. And, um, and honestly, we made a big difference. You know, we did a RICO case against one of the gangs out there that was extremely violent. Most people didn't realize between 2007 and 2010 in Salt River, um, well, Mesa, Tempe, and Scottsdale together combined for about a million people. Yeah. And during that time, they had 58 drive-by shootings. Mm -hmm. In Salt River, during that same time period with 5,000 people, we had 200 drive-by shootings. So when I became a gang and drug detective, they, sta they dropped a stack of files on my desk and said, We're, your job is to go through all these drive-by shooting cases. And so I started reading all these cases and started realizing there were some common denominators. And then we started testing the ballistics on, on the casings, snipers, National Integrated Ballistics uh, uh, Inter Information System. NIBIN, NIBIN, nice National Integrated Ballistics Information Network. And so we started going through NIBIN and, and entering all these casings in. We started realizing it was one gang that was the aggressor and the other people were responding to it. I know I'm not gonna, I'm gonna make a long story very short. We ended up putting a RICO case together on them and uh, we ended up taking it down. But we went from, to give you an idea of how much of an impact this had, in 2009, we had 76 drive-by shootings. When I took over and started working these cases, in 2010, we had 10. In 2011, we had zero. And in 2012, when I left Salt River, we had zero drive-by shootings. So it, had a, it was nice on the reservation because you could see the impact your work was having. I, um, every year, I do the, like the awards that we did at that last yeah. event. I do the awards for Salt River PD every year. Yeah. And I get to hear a lot of those cases and meet a lot of those cops. And it, it it's not a big agency, so it's like a family. Yeah. And they the chief just retired, and they have a new chief. Um, it's just it, to be invested in that sense for me to learn kind of the inner workings and hear stories like that are some of the most. Um, I love hearing them because they take great pride in the work they do. But it's fun to watch how awkward they are when they get an award for something. <laughs> because I think the last thing a cop ever wants is to be thanked or recognized as much as they deserve it. Yeah, that's right. You don't. I, I used it to my advantage when I ran for sheriff because I had gotten um, rookie of the year officer of the year the next year detective of the year in the next year and uh, so I had, it had it benefited me when I was running for sheriff but it is awkward when you get those awards because you're just doing your job especially when you're getting them in front of all of your colleagues that are going to bust your chops yeah. about it for the yeah, next yeah. year that's exactly what happens yeah. they do bust your chops about it but you know what though if you do a good job I mean I I you should be rewarded for it and recognized for it. So. I got a uh, I got pulled over uh, coming east on the ten from my kids live in Buckeye, and a trooper pulled me over, and I had no idea why. And he came up to the passenger side of my vehicle, and at the time I was doing all of the awards for DPS across the state, <laughs> and so he wrote me a ticket. Was very professional, very nice about the whole thing. Knocked my speed down a little bit and wrote me a ticket. And after he gave me the ticket, I said to him. I just want to say thanks. I said, every year, I said, I, this was when Milstead was the director. Yeah, yeah. I said, Milstead, I know Milstead, I know Wade Webb. I said, and I announce, I do your awards every year. I said, and it makes it easier for me to confidently do that job because of how professional you are. And this trooper was so upset. And I said, no, no, I'm not, I wasn't trying to get out. That's why I waited till you wrote me the ticket. I wasn't trying to name drop. He goes, no, you don't understand. I just got named Trooper of the Year for Metro West, and you have to give me my award in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so Awkward. I brought the ticket with me. That's cool. It was great. because. Yeah. But I think that the level of people, people see the police in action sometimes. We see when they do the right thing. We see when they do the wrong thing. But they don't understand the job. And when you understand what a cop endures, the track tragedy you see, yeah. the things you have to do, I, there's a level of respect that people should have for what you guys do because you carry a lot of stuff on your shoulders. And I'm glad you say that. And I agree. And that's why I do everything I can to support police and thank police because the average police officer, they estimate, goes through about 400 to 700 traumatic incidents in their career. The average citizen goes through two to four. Right. So just think about what that does to you. Uh, and police officers have a low, uh, like they die or, early. early, and that's sad to see. Um, but a lot of it is just, you know, the, the, uh, the receptors we have, your adrenaline, you, the way we spike our adrenaline down, up and down. And we're all drinking 
caffeine and like it's going out of style. We're working odd shifts during the night. It is a tremendous strain on people. There's a high rate of divorce for police officers, um, high rate of alcoholism, high rate of, I mean, I don't know how high the rate of suicide, but suicide exists there too. Sure. So it, it is a tr- takes its tremendous toll. And that's why I'm such a champion for, for this profession and for the job that these men and women do. Because on, most of the time, even the, 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 the videos you see where they portray police in a bad light, when you take the totality of it, they did a great job. And they, even then they get crucified in the media for it. And so the, the majority of these guys are good men and women that do a great job. Are you surprised or have you ever been surprised by people's perception of what you're going to be versus who you are? Yeah, there is always. People ask my chiefs and everything. They say, is he really like that? Because, you know, we did live PD. We did 60 Days In. Which I love that show, Live PD. Well, now it's called On Patrol Live. On Patrol Live. But I love that show. I loved when you were on it. Yeah, I loved it too. And I was able to co-host. I did 20 episodes of uh, Live PD Wanted. Half of them I was flying into New York. For 13 episodes, I would fly to New York every week, and then COVID hit. So we did the last seven episodes um, from Remote, home, yeah. and then obviously everything killed it after that. But it was fun to do all those things, and so people will see me from on TV or on social media, and the one of the biggest questions they have is, what's he really like? And my guys are like, he's really like that. Yeah. That's exactly it. Um, I don't change at home. I don't change anywhere. I am who I am. I can go to the meeting with billionaires or or other law enforcement chiefs or whatever. I'm usually always dressed the same, and I'm always the same. Well, <laughs> I, I used to tell when I was when I was rodeo, and I would tell people when you tell people you're from the south, they begin to talk really slow and use small words. If you wear a cowboy hat, they begin to deduct IQ points. They automatically yeah. have a perception. I watched a couple of interviews with you during the campaign, and I thought they were remarkable. They were with the Spanish-speaking networks. And I was watching a host interview you in Spanish, and you having a conversation. And the host, a couple of times, looked at the camera like, are you getting? Are you getting this? That they people, you know what? They couldn't believe the, how fluent you were and how much you really understood the culture and wanted to understand it even more. It was a remarkable look into who you really are versus live PD, the cop we see on Instagram. Right. Did, did you like that showing that side of yourself? Oh, I love it. You know, look, I I love books. I can memorize uh, quotes. We're going to isolate that, by the way. I love books is going to be the quote we use. I love uh, learning. I love statistics. If you let me look at a piece of paper for what your statistics are for your viewership or whatever for your show, you could have me come back up and an hour later and I'll tell you all the statistics. Right. So I have this, I'm blessed with the ability to remember those things. But a lot of people will tell you they're like you're a renaissance man. Yeah. You carry a gun, you're you're conservative, you've got these you've written books, you you read books, you quote you know, Aristotle, you quote Jordan Peterson, um, and you speak Spanish and you do all these things, you've lived in all these places. And honestly, when people said that I thought, "Yeah, I guess I kind of am, you know, but I think uh, that's just who I am. I, I like all aspects of that. So how hard is it hitting you that soon you're not going to be a cop anymore? Yeah, that part is hard. You know, I was with uh, at Asgia the other day speaking at Asgia. I've spoken at Asgia several times, you know, just quick little hit, you know. Arizona speech. Gang Investigators yes, Association. Arizona Gang Investigators. We use acronyms all the yeah, time. Well, I know. Yeah. Asgia, same thing <laughs> with me. And when I'm reading them, you have to know for a civilian, I go through every script because some of them, it's a word, and some of them, you say the letters. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's right. Yeah. Like yeah. it's Asgia and yeah. not A-Z-G-I-A. Yeah. Or, or the or, APA. Yeah. Or, yeah. or ACTIC. Yeah. Or, you know, anyway. Yeah. Just, That's right. So. So Asgia, um, Arizona Gang Investors Association, um, we had a posse graduation a few months ago. We had a cadet graduation recently at Gilbert PD. We had um, our memorial. All of these things. It's hit me in every one of them, and, I, and as Gia it hit me again, these are my last times I get to do these things, things that I really love. I love being sheriff. It was hard for me to go to, to get into the Senate race because it meant that I had to give up what I really love, which is the sheriff, because I couldn't run for both. And so 
it was at the same time. And the other thing is, is if you're going to do it, you better burn the boats. Yeah. And uh, I burnt the boats. I told the guy that I was running in my place. I said, I'm not changing. This was before I had any competition. I said, I don't want you to look over your shoulder. No matter who gets in this race, no matter what happens, I am not coming back to this race. And I had to do that for him. And so for me, it's been hard because all of these things to know that I'm going to give up the gun and the badge. I can't fly armed anymore. All these things are are hitting me um, little by little. And I think it's going to hit me pretty hard come November, December, when it, when the reality of I go to be in a citizen, um, it's going to be tough. So what next? You know, there's. There's power in Sheriff Lamb. There's power in, would have been power in Senate, Senator Lamb. But I think there's even more power in Citizen Lamb. I've always told people, the, great, the people who have the most power in this country are the citizens of this country. If they only knew it. If they only realized how much power they have. My voice will become even stronger because not, I'm not handcuffed to one county anymore. You know, I'm going to keep very, stay very active. We're starting something called the Secure Border Initiative, a 501c3 that will be educational for border issues in this country, fentanyl, all the crisis that come along with the border. Um, we're going to be, I'm going to be very active in, I can go to Texas, I can go to California, Arizona, the northern border. So I'm going to stay very active on that. I'm a, I love the reentry piece. I know people look at me and say, there's this cowboy conservative sheriff, but I'm also probably one of the most forward-thinking sheriffs when it comes to rehabilitation of inmates. Sure. Uh, I very have a very robust... We've had over a 1,000 inmates that have been a positively affected in the last six to eight months by my reentry program. We're building a facility. We believe in strongly in restoring the dignity and, and, and respect to these inmates the second they, they pay their penance to the society. They should start be treated... A, you know, like citizens again. Our son went through it. We saw what how how demoralizing it is to walk out of the jail and put on the same stinky clothes you went into. I'm gonna have a haberdashery in our reentry, which if you don't know what a haberdashery is, it's a men clothing thing, where we'll have these guys able to get new clothes, suits, whatever they need to to give them a leg up when they leave life. I've done veterans programs. I've done youth redirection programs. I've done tattoo removal programs. Like those things I love to do. And I'm going to stay very active in that reentry uh, space as well, helping people with mental health problems and drug problems as well. I have a friend who um, was an NFL player years and years ago, generation before us. And um, he now has a ministry that is only a prison ministry and travels to prisons all over the country for that reason, that yeah. someday most of, even when the ones that are lifers, but most of these people are going to come out. Yeah. And we, they're our neighbors. <clears throat> Wouldn't you want to know that your neighbor who went to jail is a better product than what went in? You know, I was the guy that when I first became sheriff, I thought, give him bread and water, lock him up for 23 hours a day. Yeah. But then I realized within less than a week, I thought, you know what? I have a real responsibility as a sheriff to, do, to return a better product to the society, to the community than what I got. I got them at their worst. So my job is to take them and give them all the opportunities to be a better product that goes back to society part partial in part is parcel in part is because I don't have to deal with them again. But I also want to know that if I see them at a store, I want to be able to walk up to them. You want to know how you treat your inmates, put your own son in your jail. Yeah. You'll find out real fast how you treat your inmates, but my inmates respect me and the respect of the way we treat them. And in turn, they, they treated my son with respect while he was in my facility as well. I'm also going to try to make some money. You know, as a cop, you don't make any money. Uh, so anybody out there who wants a, a, a really hardworking sheriff to represent <laughs> their company, there are so much. I real, I'm shocked at how much some of these companies pay. So I'm looking forward to actually being able to make a little bit of money. A lot of people ask me, will I get involved in politics again? I don't know. Politics is a rich man's profession, mm -hmm. and I'm not rich. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to run as a sheriff because I had a job. But the majority of the people that are out running, you have to be independently wealthy, especially a statewide race yeah. like governor, senator. You have to be have a level of wealth to where you can do that and not have to have a job. Right. I'm not that guy. 24-7. Yeah. And I think that's what made me a really great candidate. 
I was a normal guy running for a, a, an office that the majority of the time are wealthy people running for it. We've, I think in many ways we've lost elections and we've got selections now. Yeah. Uh, the powers that be select and then we get what they select. And I tried to break that system. I was, I was unsuccessful, but, um, I don't know. I don't know if the future holds politics for me. Well, I'm, I'm just. Gonna... I'm. I'm glad you didn't say radio is something in your. Face. No, no, no. I don't want you. I don't want you coming after my oh, job. Come on, with this face, I'm not doing radio. No, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You, speaking of which, here's a great question. I have a buddy that's in Yellowstone. He's in the show Yellowstone. Oh, which one is it? Lloyd. Is it... Okay, Lloyd. Lloyd. He's all over the place. That guy does a ton of stuff. So he. And he's a real cowboy. Yeah. He. We used to rodeo here in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, all over the place here and we we were in wickenburg together at an at a rodeo i was doing some announcing and he was the special guest and we handed him the, i handed him the microphone and we were laughing about it before we went on and he said that's the biggest applause i've ever gotten in this arena and i've been rodeo in this arena for years <laughs> but he's a real cowboy yeah. and broke into that world so all in all seriousness why not look at that for yourself well we're going to do i'm already working with some companies that because i like that portion of it i like being a voice and a face for law enforcement enforcement yeah for for good things good american values good traditional values so we're gonna be doing some other projects i did one with a company called american stories tv surviving man don man is a navy seal runs these people through the ringer um i kept thinking don they're not gonna be able to do that yeah and he did they would and what it real you realize that you, humans are much more capable of what they think they're capable of any physically more, mentally emotionally they're much more capable than what they think any more appearances on on patrol you know i think now that i'm out of the politics i think on patrol live would be would be willing to come back we've got a couple it's smart of other for projects. them to stay out of it yeah. you know my wife is working on a project so I don't want to go into details because I'm not a, I'm not Liberty, but um, it has to do with, you know, sheriffs and stuff. And I think it'll be a, fu a fun project, a cool project. Um, so, yeah, I, I, we do want to do some stuff like that. Look, I'm a guy that life has all sorts of opportunities for people. And uh, and we are one pe those people that walk through open doors. Most people are too caught up in emotions and and their own head and they miss what life is trying to give them. If you would just stop and, and have a good attitude and realize that not everything that happens is bad, most things that happen are good, even if it looks like it's bad on the surface. And it's meant to, uh, to really, uh, life has some great things to offer. You know, everybody says that when they lose an election or something like that happens. They all say, I'm excited about what's going to happen next. But I really believe it when you say it. I believe yeah. that when I heard you say it at Asgia, I've heard you say it before at other things. I believe it for you. I, I think that, and I said this then, and I'll say it publicly, you would have been one hell of a sheriff or a senator. I think that you would have been great at the job. I think you ran the race the right way. Um, and I think you should be proud of yourself, but I love to hear you say that you're proud of yourself and that you're looking forward to what's next. We're very proud. We don't take it as a loss. I mean, look, I didn't come out on top, but I didn't lose. Like, I mean, I, I, the people of Arizona got a chance to feel my passion. I got to share in their passion for this country, for this state, for freedom. I got to just meet so many great like-minded Americans along the way. It was a win on so many levels for us. I don't think going to Washington, D.C. is necessarily a win. No, yeah. I mean, it's that's... You know, some when I ran for sheriff the first time, they said, "So what? What happens?" I said, "What's the worst that can happen? I win, right?" Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes that is the worst that can happen. But. Well, John McCain used to say he was going to D.C. to do uh, God's work in the city of Satan. Is yeah. how he used to say it. Yeah, that's about right. You know, I used to always say, "Do you know how they make uh, anti venom for snake bites?" Yeah. Um, anti venom from snake bites. The way they make it is they actually inject snake venom into sheep into lambs because yeah. sheep are very robust and hardy animals and they're able to take the venom from the snake and they get a little sick, but in the end they're impervious to it. They're right. immune from it. Then they pull the blood back out and that's what creates an anti-venom. I kept saying that Washington needed some lamb's blood. That's right. Because it's a viper pit back there. <laughs> it is a you viper pit. You needed somebody that uh, was the anti-venom to what that viper pit is. But look, it wasn't meant to be. I have full faith and confidence that God has other things in store. I don't know what all of them are yet. I kind of started to allude to, you said something uh, uh, 10 minutes ago. 
we know that there's bigger plans for us. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they are, but in the end, but we're going to continue to push down the path we feel like we should go down, which is what the Senate was for us. It was the Jonah going to Nineveh, you know, God, when he told Jonah to go to Nineveh, he's like, I mean, nobody's going to listen yeah. over there. Yeah, I'm not Those going. Those people are going to hate it. Yep. He didn't put, he didn't tell him to go for them to listen. It was just, he wanted to go and say what he had to say. Yeah. And we felt like we were able to say what needed to be said about America, values, freedom, God, all of those things that we believe in, life, all of those things I was able to unapologetically talk about. And, um, you know, it was good. It's, uh, it's fascinating to, to talk to you about these things and, we could talk for hours, but I appreciate, first of all, the honesty and transparency, because I know we talk about a lot of things that are not easy to talk about. Yeah. Um, and I hope um, we get to see more of you now. Now that you're not strapped to that job, I hope I get to see more of you. And next time you come on the air with me, we can talk kind of like this stuff. Come on the show. And I'd love Let's to get your it. perspective as now a private citizen looking at, you know, having guys in like Milstead and having guys in like Penzone once they're out of positions of power like that or positions of authority where they've got to watch how they say things because they're representing an agency for you to be able to come on and give perspective from a citizen's point of view. Absolutely. Look, I've never really watched how I said things anyway. <laughs> I've pretty much said it the way I like to say it. Yeah, but you're smart. But there is a level of you still have to be cautious. Because you know you're representing a whole group of people. Like I posted something on Instagram today that I would have been a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I posted the. I won't even say okay. You can look at uh, it I'll later. Look it up. But uh, I would love to come on because I would love to be a voice for law enforcement. The border. I'm not, I, I intend on actually amplifying my expertise on the border. Um, I think there's a real need for it. People that are not afraid to talk about it, but that also can talk about it and have the experience to talk about it. So I would be honored to come on the show anytime. I look forward to coming on as Citizen Lamb. I told you, I think there's a lot of power in that. I think we need to get your wife in the chair too. I want to know oh. what it's like to be a cop's wife. And I want to know what she thinks about what people had to say about you when you're running for office. I have a feeling she's not as forgiving as you are. Let me tell you, this some is some of the things that were she's said sitting right you. over here. She's a tough woman. <laughs> I know and, she is. Uh, it is not easy both the people who don't like you and like you. It is hard for a wife to watch all these people come and, and love her, her husband. And, you know, she's got to be very comfortable in who we are and, and what uh, our relationship to be able to do that. So Well, and also you get to see people who they really are, because when something like this happens, I know for me, it's the people that you think are on your side or your friends and you find out quickly what they say behind your back that they're not. That's I think right. that's what hurts more than anything else, that I would be fine with how you feel if you said it to me. Yeah. But definitely. to have it said behind your back is almost, I didn't, we're not the friends I thought we were. That's, that's right. gotta be tough. It is, And but my wife, her mom was actually really good about this. Her mom would never speak ill of anything or anybody. And so my wife kind of inherited that and we've kind of adopted that. We're not perfect at it, but we try to always, you know, we have this scene. If you talk about somebody, it goes in the universe. Yeah. I was on the phone today talking about somebody and something, not in a negative way. And then my phone rang and they were calling me. Yeah. Um, so you put it in the universe, it'll come back to you. So you may as well put good stuff back out into the universe. I have a buddy that's a pastor that used to say when someone would come to him and say, you know, so-and-so said this or said this about me or did that. He said the way he would always handle it is to say, you know what? That's horrible. Let's go talk to them. Yeah. Together. Yeah. And you'll find out, are they looking to solve the problem? Because if they are, let's sit down and talk about it. And if they're just looking to gossip, they know not to come to you because you're going to want to go talk to the other person. Either way, you just dis dispel the problem. That's and I, I, that, I think that was a great way of handling it. You know, when I go in front of all these other sheriffs, I'm known as the guy that is a, a, a professional. I'm a statesman about how I'm going to say it. But if you're in the, but if you're not uh, holding up to what you should be doing, which the federal government never is, I'm going to call you out on it. Right. And even they in the federal government, ex they know that and expect that, but they know that I'm going to do it in a professional and a, and a statesman and a, in a Christian like way. And um, that's try what we've always tried to embody, you know, and it, as a sheriff, you learn you're the head of an agency of 600 people. You have to be able to make hard decisions and tell people hard things. And um, 
you know, it's part of the job. Well, listen, you've been a great sheriff. You've been a great friend. And I think you'd have been a great senator. And I appreciate the time. The whole point of these uh, podcasts are just Arizona stories. I just yeah. want I love Arizona. I've been here 30 years. I love it so much. And your story is such a key part of what Arizona is. And I appreciate you being so honest with us. Now, thank you, Mike. It's always great being on with you. All right. Mark thank Lamb. You, Thanks, thank brother. You. Catch up on amazing Arizonans, a KTAR News podcast, and click the button in the middle to subscribe.